Well, good morning. Uh, the, <laughs> abrupt. That was an abrupt changeover, but I'm not running the board up until this moment, so it's not my fault. Good morning and welcome to Gardening with Tom and Gail. Uh, we are brought to you on KFLD by the Flower Farm, and the Flower Farm is located in Kennewick on Columbia Center Boulevard, south of Clearwater. And we have the joy of being there every day to help you out from 8.30 until 6, day after day. So if you need any uh, flowers, any shade trees, any perennials, any uh, shrubbery, any beautiful uh, uh, perennials for your garden, you can find it at the Flower Farm, as well as solution to a lot of problems. And that's what we like to talk about, because many of our gardening friends are having the same set of difficulties at the same time. So that's why we uh, really like to go over some of the common things that uh, we see uh, during the previous week. So we'd like to talk about that. But before but we, we get into it, we need to follow tradition. That's right. We have to talk about the weather, and we are going to have a lot more of basically the same thing. We're supposed to be playing up to 90 degrees tomorrow, but we'll see how that shapes up. But we are also are supposed to be looking forward to the possibility of uh, showers towards the next weekend. So we um, have change coming. No, I was just thinking a, a frequent question that I get is how much water does it need? And it's relative to the weather. You know, Absolutely. you can't water it the same way in April that you're going to water it in a nice warm June. So be aware of your little plants out there. We have beautiful there. days like this when it's calm and gorgeous. We have other days when <coughs> my hair gets tousled an awful lot. <laughs> and I end up with a little bit of grit in my teeth. In those days, we really need to be extra diligent because particularly those things that are out more exposed, whether it's trees or shrubs or even hanging baskets and planters, are going to be stripped of their water a lot faster. So they really need to be watered a little bit extra. So look after it, just like you would look after your puppy, look after your kids, and uh, they'll give you a lot more beautiful response. Well, not everything in the world is going to cost you money because I can tell you that Gail and I had a delightful uh, few minutes, at least, experience. Gail noticed that uh, there was a beautiful little green hummingbird working over some of the... Uh, uh, the hanging the baskets, baskets on the caliber cow. The million bells. And it was just really a delight to watch this little green... Uh, <laughs> the wings were just screaming, and yet this thing was floating as if it was suspended by a thread. Well, that's the, you know, that is why we're so fascinated. First, you don't see them very often. That's for sure. And to have them so kind of stay in one place for a period of time is uh, really kind of unusual, I think. And no wonder people like to bring things into the garden that will attract them. Indeed. They are really a, a beautiful fascination, and they're so quick, and yet they can stop on a dime and uh, just move so gracefully. Uh, it's, it's hard to perceive that they're actually uh, adjusting their wing speed just to uh, move here and there, and they'll quickly work over one area of flowers and then go to another area of flowers and then go to another area of flowers. So really a marvel. It's so fast when they're <laughs> in high gear. It's just uh, astounding to see. But... Is, again, not that often you get a chance to see them up close. And, of course, this little creature didn't seem to uh, be affected by us at all, but it's kind of a real real delight to see something so beautiful and so unusual. We have some... There's a type of salvia that we have that uh, is the first uh, stop for the fair, pair that, that work our, our nursery over. Yeah, there are... Um, the red, they're a little bit different than the... The red forest salvia is really a, a big magnet for them, but they have their own preferences, and they hit over there the most generous uh, nectar producer first, and then they'll work their way down from there. But they do have their pattern. Of course, the hard part of keeping, uh, or should say hard part of getting the little creatures there in the first place is having food for them. So whether you have out a, a literally a sugar water container for a typical hummingbird feeder that they find first, but having the right flowers certainly makes a difference too, because once they find you, they like to come back day after day after day. And they'll set up that as part of their territory. Now, and if you're lucky, they'll else. have a little nest in the yes. area. So it's uh, every once in a while we get treated to something really unusual and uh, quite beautiful to watch. Well, listen, I forgot also to mention the fact that this is a call-in show. So if you'd like to get involved, whether it's a question or a comment or a helpful tip, it's 547-8726. Five four seven eight seven two six. Most certainly, be delightful, uh, delighted to hear from you, whether it's a question or whether it's a comment. And I guess we ought to uh, pr pursue on to the fact that uh, there's a little bit of confusion apparently about fertilizer. We still have people. Well, there's who are a lot of confusion. That, <clears throat> that because there are claims on TV that this particular type of soil has 
fertilizer so we don't have to do a blasted thing and that is far far from the truth there's just enough in it to convince you that it's something that is not and they get your money and then you get the disappointment but we also have people who are kind of seduced by convenience and so they go for the fertilizer spake spake yeah stakes yeah um, when i hear um fertilizer spikes um i have kind of a negative reaction to that because it is fertilizer that's been embedded in uh, some sort of uh, soluble substrate but they've kind of pressed it into a, a shape of a, a, a nail or something like that a fat nail and then you're supposed to put it into the ground and it will uh, slowly leach out the fertilizer which it does but it tends to not go very far from where you've put this little um, dose of fertilizer so um, if it's broken up into smaller pieces it's okay uh, but it's so much easier to just scatter some granular fertilizer on you, you don't even have to bend over i like That's that really part the trick. you don't have to pound in anything the point with the, the fertilizer spikes is that in a nutshell nobody in this industry ever uses them they have been around for at least 20 years and they have proven to be totally unreliable very slow, extremely localized on where they release their fertilizer. And that's why Gil was talking about the fact that it's practically easier to break it up into small pieces and shove them in the ground. But it's so much easier just to use either a granular or time release or even a liquid than to pretend that those fertilizer spikes are going to take care of your, all the needs of the plant for the next year. And there's, so, I'm sure there's a temperature um, absolutely. aspect so, to it, too. There's an awful lot of different types of fertilizer that will do a lot better job so we try to encourage you it's your money and your decision but there are reasons why we really encourage people to look at other things and the granular fertilizer Gail is talking about is simply very easy to use put it on once every month or so the time release fertilizers last much much longer so they still need to be just scattered around you don't have to uh, work it into the soil or do anything exotic or, or time consuming and, of course, the miracle Grow is not a bad fertilizer. It's just the fact that it's water-soluble. So today you put it on, and it's a banquet. Tomorrow when you water, you wash that fertilizer down a little bit deeper. But um, miracle Grow soluble is not the same thing as something like compost tea that I've heard about for the past few years. Because in miracle Grow, the fertilizer is in a form that the plant can use right away. Absolutely. With something organic like a fish fertilizer, there's another step in there where soil organisms have to break this product down to make it into a form utilizable by the plant. So it's kind of a, it's a much slower process if you're saying using fish fertilizer or the compost tea as opposed to a miracle Grow product, which is going to be right there right now. Exactly. And fortunately, the compost tea fad seems to have died by the wayside because it's not nearly as trumpeted as the uh, solution to all problems as it was because it does not provide the nutrients that the plant typically needs. Now, you really understand that the fertilizer is basically just a different form of food that we would call food ourselves, but we never take a combo pizza and break it down uh, and decide this is what's actually inside of it because we don't consider our diet in the same respect. But it is very close to 16, 16, 16 when you actually break it down by the nutrients. But I don't want to confuse the fact that for the plants, it isn't just the food to help it grow, but it also provides the energy to help pump the water. And so as we get into the hotter days of summer, it's really important to provide the plant with the energy to pump the water to keep its leaves cool. We're already seeing some problems, with, particularly with Japanese maple, where people haven't fertilized at all this spring. And, of course, some of the leaves are starting to show the scorch between the heat and the wind. So it's not just the fact that this material feeds the plant or makes it grow better. It also is the, helps it uh, really pump the water so it stays cool and looks so much better for you to enjoy, let alone more flowers. Well, anyway, the point is that organic material is not a bad way to go. It's just the fact that it's a time-consuming, and it's an investment in next year and the year beyond that. And it needs to be applied on a regular basis, just as you would logically apply any fertilizer. So it's not just throwing the steer manure out there once in the spring, and it's going to feed for all year. You're actually going to get the benefit of that steer manure next year and the year beyond. 
you need to be putting it on on a regular basis so the bacteria, the microbes that actually eat the stuff are always being fed just like you would be using granular fertilizer. So if you are going to take an organic approach, understand that it's going to take a long-term approach because it's an investment in next year and the year beyond, but you still are also dependent on the bacteria, all the microbes to help break it down. So it takes a long time, but constant feeding, not just once a year. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing for, and if it was, give us a call and uh, we'll talk about it. (laughs) We got bugs, Gail, lots of bugs. It's warming up. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, there And there are two, well, maybe three really pesky ones right now. Earwigs are really out there They are mass. really starting to do some serious damage out there in the garden, and uh, it really needs to be controlled. Gosh, I had a lady who brought in a, a little baggie of leaves, and it was practically all that was left on these leaves uh, were the veins of the leaf, and all the rest of it looked like lace, which is a classic, classic earwig way. damage. The, the earwigs love that nice soft tissue in between the veins and that's how we can tell for sure that you're being devoured but they also love the soft luscious tips of your flowers so your roses and many other things are eaten away too i mean literally just eaten away yep you'll uh, see holes or the tips gone on buds on the roses now when we see this damage you always chuckle well the answer is chickens because (laughs) they do clean up earwigs but they come along with their own bigger set of uh, challenges so we encourage people to just simply use a granular bait, and that seems to really do a good job. Now, the bait is not going to be absorbed by your plants, whether it's vegetables or flowers, but the bait is also unfortunately affected by the fact that we have to water every day nearly, and that the fact that it's going to be affected by the intensity of the sun. So after a couple of weeks, we know that the uh, actual value of the bait diminishes pretty quickly. So we encourage people to refresh it just a little bit every two weeks because the earwigs are very very mobile and they're always looking for newer pastures and so if you haven't got any your neighbors will give you some very quickly um and then another uh major pest we're seeing a lot of damage from is the black vine weevil because the adults have hatched and they're out there feeding at nighttime um chewing along the edges of the leaves and they're you know they're pretty omnivorous i mean if they can find a nice evergreen plant they prefer that first but they'll move on to lots of other things yeah a lot of times we hear them called rhododendron weevils but they are equal opportunity parasites they'll eat literally practically anything including roses lilacs uh lots and lots of different things that they uh, feed on so they they damage tends to be just along the margin of the leaf on the exterior border so you'll see either a sawtooth or a um, crenellated sort of a damage on the edge of the leaf so it's really pretty easy to identify now just like the earwigs these guys are nighttime foragers and so it's really unusual for us to see them during the day you know the, <laughs> the sun doesn't set until about 9:30, and it gets back up about 5:30. so typically we're not out there to see the uh the, either the appearance or the retreat of these little creatures. And so it's just a mysterious damage that seems to show up, but it's still very alarming. And the other uh, aspect of black vine weevil is that when they uh, lay their eggs in the soil, these ha- hatch into larvae that can feed on the root system of the plant. So it's and kind they of a. They are actually more damaging to the plant than the uh, few bites off the leaves. So it's a really serious pest. But since they're hatching now, I think the best uh, approach to control is to deal with the adults and try to get rid of as many adults as you can. That's right. So there are sprays that you can put on for that. And it is just not one product that fits it all because we see the damage on vegetables and as well as on ornamentals. And so we can't offer the same kind of uh, product for the solution of control on one compared to another. So it really is an individual basis. And that's why we kind of like to be involved in the guidance. And that's what we're there for too, is to give you a step-by-step control, but making sure that you're using the right approach rather than inadvertently causing problems for yourself. Gil, we have to take a break, but we'll be right back to talk more about bugs chewing your garden.